What we're doing, we're not asking them for money or pitching any deals or anything. We're basically uh, helping them to understand that there's better ways to invest their money. A lot of these private lenders I'm dealing with, they're, they're, they're not only they're not only not making money, they're losing money in the stock market, losing money with their retirement accounts. And so we come along and present our private lending program and it's an excellent opportunity for them to make a whole lot more money than they already make it. Yeah. And this was a, a real game changer for me. I, I mentioned earlier that I was just not interested in real estate and I just kind of like got drug into it because I was helping Eric. But what really changed for me was when I realized how much of a difference I was making in other people's lives by giving them this opportunity to invest with us. Mm -hmm. And once I realized that I was making a difference and that I wasn't trying to sell them anything or convince them to do anything. When I realized that it was the difference in their lives that I was making, I felt like I couldn't hold my program back to anyone because it's such a great opportunity for them. Yeah. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, your host, also known as the Private Money Authority, and it's on this podcast that we talk about how to raise private money for your real estate deals without ever having to ask for money. That's right. You are already approved. There's no applications. There's no credit scores and you never have to ask to get money. That's what we're going to talk about. Well, my guest today here on the show, amazing, amazing individuals. I've known this dynamic duo couple for, I think now at least four years, I'll get them to correct me if I'm wrong. Well, anyway, they have raised $3.3 million in private money and they just keep using it over and over and over again on multiple deals. Well, this husband and wife team, they are known as the property peddling power couple, a couple uh, behind the name of their company, which is called Salt and Light Property Solutions. Salt and Light Property Solutions. Obviously, you already know that they are Christians with the name like that for their company. Well, they hail from the vibrant streets of New Orleans, Louisiana, and this real estate dream team traded all that city buzz and loud noises for the serenity of Southwest Mississippi, where they now reside and live on 60 acres in a log cabin with their four kids and a small army of pets. Now in their quest to conquer the real estate world, this husband and wife team have become the proud parents of over 50 deals, managing a whopping 40 doors, 22 storage units. They are accredited investors, published authors got their own best selling book, and they're the masterminds behind a thriving local RIA that they started and founded. Uh, right there where they live. Well, this power couple, they're taking Southern Mississippi and Louisiana by storm, and they've got their eyes set on expanding all along the Gulf Coast. Now, they're not just busy crunching numbers. And in addition to that, you'll find them camping in the great outdoors, passionately serving their church and unleashing their competitive spirit in combat sports. But the fun doesn't stop there. Did you know the husband of this team knows how to speak like a Tuscan sand raider while his wife loves skulls for some weird and kind of creepy reason? That is weird. Well, their company, Salt and Light, it's where business meets a symphony of laughter and extraordinary adventures. Look, we're going to dive deep into this couple. We're going to learn how they've raised millions and millions of dollars in private money, how they've gone about it without ever asking anybody for money in just a moment. You're going to meet Eric, also known as Banjo, and his wonderful wife, Erica Carmadale, right after this.
Oh my lands, it's Banjo and Erica Carmadale live right here in the flesh. My first question. First of all, welcome to the show, guys. Thank you so much, man. Good afternoon. Good to be here. Yeah. Yes, this is fine. Listen, if you're listening to this show right now, yeah, I promise you, you do not want to turn the dial. Well, that's back when radios had dial. <laughs> you do not want to change this channel or delete or go somewhere else. Until you've heard this whole show, because Erica and Banjo are going to dive deep, give you step by step advice from their own experience as to how they've raised all this private money without ever asking anybody for money. So this is going to be a dynamic episode. So welcome to the show, y'all. My first question is, Erica, why do you like skulls? <laughs> Um, well, it was something that my uncle used to collect. And after he passed away, I just kind of took over it in his memory. What kind of skulls? Um, I have like ceramic skulls from when we went on vacation that I have as a souvenir. Um, Are you talking about skulls that look like human being skulls? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, Erica, I thought I knew you pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's not talk about that anymore. Um, so, <laughs> let's let, let's get it. Let's get into your all's experience on raising private money. So, first of all, what attracted you all to real estate and investing back when? What year did you all start, and what attracted you? Well, two thousand eight would be the reason we started. The reason, or the time we started, and the reason is because I got introduced to it by a friend of mine at the time. He was a friend and became a partner. And he started giving me these facts about uh, wealth and how what percentage of, of the millionaires in America or in the real estate and how it's passive income. And I was really intrigued by it. And so I took him for his word and, 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 you know, took his advice. And that's, that's when I started, I turned my first house into a rental back in 2008. So, so you became a bona fide real estate investor in 2008. So how old were you? 17 years old? <laughs> I think in 2008, <clears throat> I was more of a boneheaded uh, real estate investor because I did it all wrong for many, many years. <laughs> well, what did you do wrong? What were your, what were your early mistakes? Man, it was this one house really that I owned that whole time up in 2018 uh, till I really got serious about it, but I was very uh, procrastinating kind of guy. It was all about hobby. It was basically a hobby, like a little side gig, a way to just kind of make extra money. That's, that was the main mistake right there is in my mm. head. I thought about real estate as a way to make a little extra money. Mm. Well, there's a writer downer. When, what year did you get serious? 2018 is when I got really serious. All right. What's the definition of getting serious? Investing in some teaching and training and uh, creating a vision and a goal. Not like I do now. Don't get me wrong. 2018, I didn't know anything about visions or goals. But at the time, I had an idea that I want to leave my nine to five, become a real estate entrepreneur. One day I'm going to own several units and create this passive income and work for myself. So you sort of started answering my next question. What have you got ESPN? <laughs> um, so my next question was going to be, you know, so when you got serious, you know, you started getting educated, you know, you're investing money on your real estate investing education. Um, what was your initial vision when you really got serious? I heard you say part of it was, you know, retire from the day job nine to five uh, to where you wouldn't have shackles around you for that. Uh, what other parts of your vision did you have when you started out? Um, I guess you could say, well, wealth, you know, uh, being able to leave a legacy for my children, teaching my children how to run business, uh, teaching them about real estate, uh, not wanting for much, um, that kind of stuff, you know, being able to do what I, what I want to do when I want to do it with who I want to do it with. And for how long you want to do it. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> so um, now Eric, now Erica, 
when did, when did you i mean were you all on board with banjo back in 2018 so i supported him and whatever he wanted to do but i had nothing to do with it um i didn't I didn't think real estate investing was something for me. Um, just cause well, you, you were, you were a school teacher, right? I was a high school math teacher. Um, and so I supported him, but it wasn't until about 2020, um, when I came on board and we really started getting serious and making this a business. Okay. I got you. So, you can put two, and two together. Just go figure when <laughs> we actually started being successful. So when she came on board, <laughs> Well, I mean, I could have told you that, right? It's like, yes. <laughs> well, when you started out, what were some of the biggest challenges you faced in those early years? Now, when I say early years, I'm talking about starting out in 2018. Um, that list might be pretty long, but anyway, what were some of the biggest challenges? And then how did you overcome those challenges? So in 18, one of our biggest challenges, uh, I would say was, Cash. Uh, we needed cash to, we were doing a lot of creative deals from 2018 to 2020. And what do you mean by creative? What do you mean by creative deals? I mean, uh, when we call people and they wanted cash, we weren't doing that. We were, but you were offering to buy it like on terms, subject to existing, no owner, fin seller financing, et cetera. Yes. And the majority of those folks wanted a pretty decent down payment. And so mm -hmm. my partner had some capital and we expended a ton of capital, but there were a lot of deals that we needed to pass up because we didn't have, well, one, we didn't have enough capital to be just buying these houses cash all the time. Mm -hmm. And we had, or Jeff mostly had enough capital to buy. I think we ended up doing five deals in five months. We were, we were getting after it, but uh, we ran out of money at some point. We had to slow down, tap the brakes. Um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't call it shiny object syndrome, but I would say maybe lack of uh, systems probably was a hurdle back then. Um, mm -hmm. Because both me and my partner found some holes, some multiplex properties that kind of took our attention away from the flipping business that we were partnered up in. And that basically came to a stop. So a yeah. couple of different challenges. In well, in and, and during that time when we had those new apartments, they were all working on their own you know, they were in there doing the repairs. And so if you're tied up doing the repairs, you're not making more calls, getting more deals. Uh, so time. Also. So you, so when you started out in those early years, you were doing your own rehabbing, right? For the most part. And if I could do it, I was going to do it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what I say? Uh, you've probably heard me tell this story, but anyway, a few years ago at, at one of our live events, uh, an attendee, um, I was talking about rehabbing and one of the attendees just made the comment said, you know, Jay, I just love rehabbing my own houses because it's like therapy to me. And my immediate response was anybody that rehabs their own houses needs therapy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which you probably came to realize that right, man, Joe? Yeah. Yes. Yep. I agree. So, so one of your biggest challenges was you ran out of cash, right? Yeah. Yeah. And was that running out of cash to invest in more houses or was that running out of cash period? Usually to run, uh, to get more housing, get more. Okay. Housing. So yeah. you ran out of cash because the majority of the for sale by owners, as all of us know, in the real world require all the cash. Now, you know, if, you know, if you're really good and you can negotiate and you understand creative financing, um, uh, you know, there's a percentage of people, of course, that will say, I mean, I've bought a bunch of houses on subject to, uh, not recently in this market, but, um, the majority of mine have been all cash for private money. So how did you fix that challenge of getting money to have cash, uh, to do deals? We learned how to raise private money. So that really was the, that really was the pivoting point, right? 100%. Yep. That was our missing, that was our missing piece to the puzzle. Um, we knew how to do terms deals and we can only get so many. And then once we found the private money that just put it all together for us. So let's deep dive into you two's emotions. Describe how you felt when you got your first private lender that told you they had X number of dollars. We'll start with that. How did that make you feel. I got a speeding ticket. 
Well, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I remember, I remember the day it was a family friend. Uh, and I remember a long time ago, he mentioned that he, 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 he called me up and was asking me if I knew any good places to invest his money. Um, uh, and I didn't at the time. I just knew that from the little bit that I knew about investing was that, and I don't even know if this is good advice, but this is all I, I know at the time. <laughs> I said, I don't know. I heard that if you uh, invest money with a financial advisor, make sure they're, they're doing commissions. That way, if you're making money, he's making money. But if you're not making money, then he's not making money anyway. That's all the advice I got for him back then. And then that guy entered my mind when I was, uh, you know, writing down people that I can present this opportunity to. And so I called him up and I reminded him about that time. And he was he was very, very interested in hearing about everything. And I was very excited because I knew I can help him find what he was looking for. And I knew he can help me find what I was looking for. And it's been a great relationship ever since then. Wonderful. And um so how did you all feel when you closed your first deal with it was, awesome. it was awesome when i got my first check I, like it's kind of nuts now if i go buy a property and i have to like bring money to closing that's <laughs> weird to me i don't like that feeling we usually no. get a check at closing when we buy a property right yeah yes. i also remember when we first got our private money we were like Oh, wow. Like it was burning a hole in our pocket. We felt so much pressure to go find that first deal because it wasn't our money to spend. It was that added motivation to go get those deals. Yeah. Very big obligation to provide the high rates of return. As you're telling your private lenders, you're going to provide for them when, the, when you get that first private lender. And let's say in our case, it's a 200,000. Well, it was 400,000 at first. That's, uh, you know, in our market, that's a lot of money. Um, our, our after repaired values on our houses are range around 200, you know, for a, a first time home buyer, 150 to 200. So it puts the pressure on you to, to do what you say you're going to do. And you tell somebody you're going to give high rates of return. You got to go hurt and find them deals and get it going. Now you mentioned something a moment ago that I don't want our listeners to miss. You said you typically pick up a big check when you buy a property. That's correct. And take none of your own money to the closing table. That's correct. How in the world can you pick up a big check when well, you purchase? Yeah. So we do not allow any of our private lenders to lend more than 75% of the after repaired value of a house. And so for instance, let's say this house is a $200,000 house we can borrow up to 70, uh, 175 percent, which is one hundred fifty thousand dollars. That leaves a fifty thousand dollar conservative large equity cushion to protect us, the private lenders and our, our us, the investors and our private lenders. Uh, let's say we get the property super cheap and the rehab is a me, uh, medium rehab. We will borrow a little bit more than we need for that rehab and that house. And it gives us a little extra cash. Not to mention you have the rehab expenses wrapped up in that check as well. So uh, just to be clear uh, for everybody to understand, you'll borrow up to 75% of the after repaired value, not 75% of the purchase price. That's correct. And um, if your listeners are as conservative like me and Erica are, they're probably thinking the same thing me and Erica thought mm -hmm. when we did our first deal. And that's, I don't need to borrow 75% of the after repaired value of the house. Mm -hmm. I'm going to borrow exactly what I need. And mm -hmm. we made that mistake too on, on our first couple of deals. Uh, so why did that end up being a mistake? Well, I don't know if you ever met my friend. He's become a fan. He's become a friend. Uh, his name's Murphy. Yeah. I've met Mr. Murphy uh, many yeah. times. He, he's more like a relative than a friend. He's got a real <laughs> bad habit of showing up in our rehab houses. Uh, mm -hmm. he, I think he's related to that guy named Mayhem. I see him on a bunch of oh, other yeah, commercials. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he, you know, when Murphy shows up, he can bring his cousins and his family members and everything. And, and it's really, really good. It's, I would say it, it's almost more conservative to make sure you borrow the 75% of the after repaired value. That way, 
you are ready and poised when Murphy shows up. It's not if, it's when. And then yep. you'll be ready to just handle those problems when they pop up. Yeah, we and weren't we thinking about Murphy. We weren't thinking about all of the um, carrying costs that comes along with it, all the interest that we were paying to our lenders. Um, so all of that extra money, extra money that we borrowed uh, really helps out. Sure. And just to be clear for the sake of our audience, what Eric and Eric are talking about on Murphy is really not a person. It's back to the phrase, Murphy, the, the law of Murphy, if anything can go wrong, it will go wrong. And you know, in the rehabbing business, it always costs more than you thought it would. It always takes longer than you thought it would, uh, which is a, makes the case for don't ever buy a single family house with uh, that needs rehab without a home inspection for goodness sakes. So, so yeah, I'm, uh, you know, I, I love it. You know, when I'm doing deals, uh, when I'm doing a deal, um, in fact, I just closed on one this past Friday and I uh, got a big check, got a big check uh, yesterday. Um, actually the check is over $100,000. I love getting paid over a hundred thousand dollars to buy a property and I haven't done anything with it. Of course, a big check of a hundred thousand dollars is going to be going towards the renovation. But here's what I've learned. Here's a great checkpoint. Uh, as to whether you should do a deal or not when you're paying all cash, whether you're using your own cash or you're using private money. And that is, and here's a writer downer. If you can't bring home a big check when you buy, you shouldn't do the deal. I mean, right there is your uh, checkpoint. If you can't bring home a big check when you buy, now, of course, this only works when you're buying properties at deep discounts. And when you buy properties at deep discounts, you buy properties at deep discounts when they need renovation. That's why you're getting the discount. So that's a good check. But in fact, my favorite phrase on my real estate attorney's check stub that I pick up, which my real estate attorney is, can you believe just right here next door, uh, 12 feet down the sidewalk. In fact, I just saw her before getting here on the show, but my favorite phrase on her check stub is excess cash to close. And my lands don't I love me some excess cash. So, you know, this show raising private money is all about raising private money without ever asking anybody for money. So Erica Banjo, how do you all go about getting $3.3 million in private money that you're able to use over and over and over again on uh, real estate deals? And then and you never ask anybody for money. How in the world does that work? We had to flip our mindset. We're, we're all conditioned uh, when we need capital, especially for houses. We have to go to the bank and beg them, please, and submit all this paperwork and your red, red tape all over the place. And you're constantly in this state of please, 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 Mr. Banker, can I please have some fun so I can buy this house? And when you're working with private lenders, you have to flip your mindset. We never asked any private lender that has ever came on board to do business with us for money, or we've never pitched a deal or anything like that. What we do is we have perfected and established and perfected our perfect private lending program, which our private lenders love as a product itself. And what we do is we just basically ask them, listen, do you know, do you or anybody, you know, have any liquid capital? or any retirement accounts that's not making high rates of return. And the key words are safely and securely, not only just safe and secure, but secure by an actual piece of real estate. And if they say, yes, I do know somebody or something like that, then that's when we go and explain a little bit about what we do and see if they're interested in and hear more about it. And so what we're doing, we're not asking them for money or pitching any deals or anything. We're basically, uh, helping them to understand that there's better ways to invest their money. A lot of these private lenders I'm dealing with, they're, they're, they're not only, they're not only not making money, they're losing money in the stock market, losing money with their retirement accounts. And so we come along and present our private lending program and it's an excellent opportunity for them to make a whole lot more money than they are already making. Yeah. And this was a, a real game changer for me. I, I mentioned earlier that I was just not interested in real estate and I just kind of like got drug into it because I was helping Eric. But what really changed for me was when I realized 
how much of a difference I was making in other people's lives by giving them this opportunity to invest with us. Mm -hmm. And once I realized that I was making a difference and that I wasn't trying to sell them anything or convince them to do anything, when I realized that it was the difference in their lives that I was making, I felt like I couldn't hold my program back to anyone because it's such a great opportunity for them. Yes. Yes. But, and you nailed it on the head. I mean, that, that shift in mindset, instead of asking for a mortgage or applying for a mortgage, you know, there's, there's no selling, begging, chasing or whatever. It's all about teaching, putting on your teacher hat, explaining the program just exactly as you said. Now, so, so you share the program. Um, what's, what's your favorite ways to get the word out? I mean, there's multiple ways to get the word out, but what's yeah. your favorite ways to share with people what your private lending program is? Here you go. <laughs> oh, my favorite way is to do um, a private lender luncheon. We do a little presentation and um, feed everyone some lunch and let them know about our program. But I'll add, there's a caveat to that. So private lender luncheons in the beginning were not our favorite way to do it because <laughs> we've never done one yet. Right. And those things are scary if you've never done a professional any kind of luncheon and, and so in the beginning my favorite way to do it was phone calls i'm, I'm gonna get on the phone type of guy erica is more of a, a text messaging person so i would get on the phone and call people and talk to them about it and then erica would uh, do the facebook message and I'm yep. Leave them. yep gotcha so what is a private lender luncheon and why is that your favorite way <laughs> so a luncheon is where um, we get together um, with people that we know. We invite team members. We just invite our people that we've met networking, friends, family. Um, and we get together about 25 people and we feed them lunch and then we let them know about our program. So, so you feed them lunch and so you let them know about your program. So you've got a presentation, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah the way you're teaching. So are you like talking about any deals that you need funding for in this, or are you just teaching how the program works? Nah, it's an overview. It's it, we, we try to hit all of the most important points that a private lender is going to be concerned about. Gotcha. Uh, how, how are they protected? Why would they want to do business with us? Why do we want to do business with them? Now, as far as pitching a deal or kind of like, all right, guys, this is the deal. This is what the money's going to look like. That's definitely not what we're talking about here. We have a couple of slides with a couple of deals that recent deals that we've done funded with private lending, just so they can get an idea on, on what we're talking about. But as far as the pitching a, a particular deal, no. Okay. So I heard you say a few minutes ago that you don't ask for money. And so how, if you don't ask for money and you do a private lender luncheon, how many private lender luncheons have you done? We're up to 12 now. 12 private lender luncheons for goodness sakes. Um, well, that, that triggers another question. Um, those 12 private lender luncheons, I mean, like, did you already have all them people in your cell phone or contacts or did you like run through your contacts and then you had to like go meet new people or something? Yeah. So that's the beauty of this business and, and getting a mentor, obviously like we're part of your mastermind. It helps tremendously. And what I mean by that is when I first started this business, people would talk, you would hear Facebook is a social network thing. It's like, what does network really mean? You hear about these network meetings. I never knew what networking meant. Now I do. And so once we've uh, taught all of our people what we do that we already know, which probably was about 300, 400 people, right? We talked to them. They either weren't interested or they were. Well, now what? Right. So we're out at the gym. Like like you said in our intro, we like combat sports. So we're doing our jujitsu and our kickboxing stuff. And we know people at the gym. Um, I'm in the Rotary Club and certain little networking groups that I go and visit uh, church, anywhere that, you know, people and you can network with network, meaning talk to them, see how you can help them, see how you can serve them or their business. And lo and behold, while you're talking, sooner or later, somebody's probably going to ask you, well, what do you do? And that's gives you an opportunity to share with them that you teach people how to make a lot of money using a little known strategy called private lending. 
Uh, so we well, that's how you that's how you introduce yourself when you're meeting somebody new. When so, like, let's say you just met me, I say, well, Banjo, what do you do? Hey Jay, how you doing? Yeah, uh, I teach people how to make a whole lot of money using this little known strategy called private lending. I love it. I love it. Now you said something a moment ago. So well, well here, there's another question first. You've done 12 private lender luncheons. You've raised 3.3 million. You used to be full time working at the, working on the railroad, right? Or working at the railroad. <laughs> yeah. I bet you're working on the railroad like the song. <laughs> but um, so when you started raising private money, how soon were you able to retire from your day job and go completely full time real estate entrepreneur? About seven months. Seven months. There's another reason to learn all about private money. So. You did those 12, 12 private lender luncheons. I'm curious to know, maybe, you know, maybe you don't know. Um, how many of those people that have been to 12 private lender luncheons ever had ever heard about private money or private money? Who I don't know that for sure, but if I had to guess, I'm going to say 90 to 95% probably have never heard of private lender luncheon. And it might be higher than that. Yeah. The reason I'm curious is, um, my wife, Carol, Joy and I, we've got 47 private lenders and not one of them, not one of them had ever heard of private money or private lending. And of course we don't have time in this show to talk about self-directed IRAs, but they had never heard of self-directed IRAs and how they can take a current retirement fund and move it over to a self-directed IRA company and then loan their retirement funds out for high rates of return. Um, none of them had heard of that strategy. In fact, not one of my 47 private lenders even knows what an accredited investor is. Right. So, you know, in this world of private money, they, um, <laughs> we just got a comment, Martel, first time listening, but I like the topic. Welcome to the show, Martel. But anyway, um, yeah, they never heard, never heard of, um, private lending, which means that's why you need to have your, your teacher hat on. Now, Banjo, you, you said something a few minutes ago. I don't want our listening audience to miss. And that is, he said, I never ask for money. So they're at the private lender luncheon. How in the world do you get people to tell you they want to invest and how much they've got to invest and how much they want to start with without you asking? Yeah. So before they even come to the private lender luncheon, the majority of those attendees have heard about our private lender luncheon. Some of them have even heard all the details of it, but uh, most of the people have at least heard of our private lender luncheon and are interested in learning more. So I know that those, that majority are interested in it. At the very least they're interested. A, a handful, maybe a few, they're coming for support They, you know, or just because they're friends of the family and they know a little bit about private lending, but they're mostly coming for the Erica's white chocolate brick. <laughs> okay. And when we are done with the private lender luncheon, I simply say, thank you guys for coming. I hope you enjoyed yourself. And at the very least learned a little bit that you didn't know before you came here. And at the very least, uh, enjoy the food. Hope you like the venue. Talk to you later. Um, Erica hands out a little piece of paper and it's basically, uh, information, uh, not an information, but, uh, I guess an interest, uh, it gauges their interest and it has three check marks. So I mean, they're interested. Yeah. All in, let's go right now. Uh, maybe I'm interested in the future or I'm not just, I'm just not interested at all. So whether they fill that piece of paper out or not, that's up to them. But the way I find out if they're interested or not is I just call them up. I give them a call after. I give them a day to think about it, let them sleep on it, call them the next day. And the funny thing about it is I never ask anybody if they want to pledge anything toward our private lender program. I don't ask them if they're interested. I don't even mention the sheet that they filled out. I just ask them three questions. Usually I'm wanting to know, can we get better at what we're doing during this private lender luncheon? as far as the food is concerned, the venue and the actual presentation, as far as delivery and the information that they received. Mm -hmm. And the cool part about it is that I don't have to ask them because they volunteer that information. Anyway, as soon as I start talking to them, they're going to talk to you about 
about it, about their interest, whether they're not interested. And a lot of times I'll tell you why they're not interested and maybe they're good, you know, so that's, that's how we do it. So you just follow up with them right after the luncheon, ask them three questions to give you feedback on how was the presentation? How was the food? How can we improve? And then without you even asking if they're interested, they're going to tell you automatically, right? Well, if you think about it, you gotta, it's a mindset switch again, and it's hard to figure because private lending is so awesome for us in our business. It's hard to figure that you offering private lending, a private lending program to an individual is just as awesome as a blessing as a private lender is to your company. Mm -hmm. But it truly is. And I mean, you take somebody who's worked hard all of their life. They finally retired or nearing retirement. They're worried about all this stuff going on in the market, but you come along and offer them a nice, predictable, steady, high rate of return. And they know you. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful marriage. It certainly is. Now you said you never asked anybody for money. You just explained how they tell you how much they've got. If they want to start, they bring that up on their own in the follow-up. Now, so let's say you've got a private lender. They've told you they want to start with, you know, $150,000 or whatever. And now you got a deal for them to fund. How do you get them to fund your deal without pitching? Because you said earlier, you said, I never pitch a deal, never pitch a deal. So how do you get your deal funded? I mean, they told you how much they want to invest, All right. but how, how do you get the deal funded without pitching the deal? The good news phone call, Jay. It's, the good uh, news, well, 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 what in the world is the good news phone call? Well, if one of my private lenders are excited enough to enter into our private lender program and they, they pledge $150,000, the last thing they're expecting me to do is call them up and try to pitch them a deal they already have revealed that they would love to do business with us. So mm -hmm. I just call up with some good news and say, Hey man, I got some great news. Found us a deal. This is, this is the summary of the deal. I give them a couple of little details of the deal and, uh, and move forward. And, you know, so that's, that's it. Do you ask them if they want to do the deal? Oh no. I know they want to do the deal. They already told me that when they placed the money. Okay. So you call them up, you tell them a little bit about the deal. So if you don't ask them, what do you, what do you do? What do you do? Do you just get, do you give them instructions on like the, is the real estate attorney going to email them wiring instructions or, or, or it's like, it's like, you're not asking them. You're just like telling them what's going to happen. Right? Yeah. Hey, good news, Jay. Got a deal for us, man. At $150,000 you wanting to put to work. I found a deal that I can put it right to work. You and know, of course you're not going to, you're not going to bring a deal for them to fund unless it matches the criteria of the private lending program that you already taught them about, right? 100%, 100%. Yep. And so, so it sounds like it's very important to separate conversations between teaching the program and then having a deal for them to, to do and to fund the deal. Right? Absolutely. So what was yours and Erica's process for learning about private money? So, uh, private money was introduced to me in 2018. Um, I learned about it from this guy. His name is Jay Connor. <laughs> I was at, I was attending a, I was attending an, a live event and you spoke, uh, I think it was a whole day about private lending and flipping and all that stuff. Now I was at an event that was teaching about creative finance and, uh, buying properties very creatively which by the way, was like drinking water through a fire hose. The first time I ever heard anything about that, any of that stuff, but uh, something intrigued me about your business model and the way you, you run your business. Fast forward a couple of years, Erica joins in and I'm saying, Hey babe, there's this guy I seen him a couple of years ago. In fact, I seen you again, and I think in new Orleans and it re uh, it just confirmed that the business model that you presented, I really just, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, I clicked with it. I love it. And so I said, let's go, let's go see Jay. 
you know, so that's it's not what he said. He said, let's go to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> that's why like, you know, there banjo brides, you right? Like my, my live events are uh, here, oceanfront uh, hotel. And so he says, let's go to the beach, right? <laughs> that's right. Well, and shoot, I mean, you all came to that event and seven months later, yeah, you were full time retired from the railroad. Um, I mean, what is different about you all? I mean, you know, some people come to a live event and nothing changes for them. I mean, same pe I mean, same information, same information that I'm teaching from stage. Some people have a transformation like you two. Yeah. Some people don't. Why is that? What, what makes you all different to where you had this transformation in such a short period of time? I mean, looking back at it, I can explain it probably better because I've learned so much since I've entered into your world, this world of private money and flipping and, and, and joined your mastermind and all that good stuff. But if you think about the 13 principles of think and grow rich, um, one of the principles is decision making. Um, specialized knowledge is another one. And the fact that we were gaining this specialized knowledge, we, I, I knew from what I seen that this model will work. It's confirmed, you know, a third confirmation that this is good. And, and at this point, I've got a multiplex property. I've got some storage units. I've probably flipped about 10 or so houses creatively. And so I got some, I got enough real estate experience to know that this is going to work. Um, and then it was decision time. So Erica and I really made a decision to join your mastermind. Again, another principle of think and grow rich. The book is called think and grow rich. So, uh, go read it if you haven't read it already. Um, and, and, and the accountability piece, the, the amount of specialized knowledge and education you receive by networking with individuals that are doing the same business you're doing is what really catapulted us and accountability. So, you know, I was talking to Chaffee, one of your uh, coaches and team members at your live event. And I told him that my plan to leave the railroad was January of 2023. This was mm -hmm. October of 2020 that I told him this. And that was a pretty conservative plan, I thought. But he, he, he beat it up pretty good. He said, no, that's a, that's a ridiculous plan. It's so weak. And, and he made me think about it. He, made, he challenged me. I, I told him at that lunch, I said, man, I know I can do 10 times better if I ever left the railroad. I'd have 100% of my focus right on my business. I'd do 10 times better. He said, no, you don't. And I said, what do you mean, no, I don't? He said, well, quit then. And I said, well, yeah, but if I quit, he said, but nothing. If you really truly believe that you'll be doing 10 times better if you can quit your job, then quit. And so what that did for me is it made me go home and wrestle with that. I had to wrestle with, because I really did believe that I could do 10 times better if I left the railroad. So why, what am I doing? Why am I procrastinating? Why am I waiting so long? So fast forward, we did decide to jump all in, went full time with you and your mastermind. Uh, and it was awesome because it, it really challenged us. And then, so then we were able to uh, hatch a plan, a real plan, a challenging yet attainable plan. And we follow through with it, you know? So, um, you know, it's nothing, I don't know if it's too much different with us, but it's the decisions that we've made that really made a big difference in our trajectory and how fast we got to where we were going. What I'm hearing you say is you just made a bona fide commitment. Absolutely. Yes. You made a bona fide commitment that, that you were going to make it happen. Well, I mentioned in your introduction, but I want, I really want to bring it now. You all are a published author published author. And uh, let's talk about your book. Let's talk about how people can get your book. Um, you know, here on Raising Private Money, uh, a percentage of the audience are real estate investors wanting to raise private money for their deals. But we also have here in the audience, we have individuals that are looking for better rates of return with their investment capital. They might have money in a CD that right now, boy, rates are coming down fast. I mean, they are coming down fast at the bank. Here at First Citizens Bank, I met with them earlier today and seven months ago, uh, they were offering five, five and a quarter percent uh, for a uh, seven month CD. That's mm -hmm. already about 
dropped down to four and a quarter. And if you look at their long term rates or whatever, they're expecting rates to drop tremendously. But uh, how can how can people that are listening to this show that really want to have an opportunity to get higher rates of return? I mean, how many private lenders? I mean, I know you got three point three million that you keep using over and over and over again on different projects. But how many uh, private lenders do you currently have? We're about 15 right now. Mm -hmm. All right. So 15 private lenders. So um, tell people about your book. What's the name of your book? I don't know if you got a, a book handy that you can hold up for those that are watching on YouTube. Not right, right now. Not right, now. Right, right here. Well, what's, the name of, what's the name of your book and how can they get your book and what is the book about? Sure. It's, it's called Low Risk High Returns. You can find it on Amazon. But if you go to our website, www.saltandlightpropertysolutions.com, You'll see a couple of menu items up there and just go to the real estate investing tab and you'll see a copy of our book there. And you'll be able to uh, click the link to go to Amazon. And also, if you just want to chat, chat it up with us, you can uh, click our little chat box right there and you'll get me or Erica. All right. So for those of you listening, uh, some of you watching, uh, make note of this www.saltandlightpropertysolutions.com. That's salt and light property solutions.com go there to the website. If you're looking for higher rates of return, this book will, so why would somebody want to get this book? What's the book going to reveal to the it, reader? It, it gives you a view a 40,000 foot view of what private lending is, how it works. And then it dives deep into our private lending program to give a good example of what a good private lending program would look like. Awesome. So if you're listening to this show and you're remotely interested in learning about how to get really, really high rates of return safely and securely doing business with two of the most reputable people I know on the planet, they got a servant's heart. They want to make a difference. They want to give back and they take care of their private lenders. Um, have, have any of your private lenders ever lost money? Oh, no. <laughs> Absolutely not. Have all of your private lenders received every interest uh, check, every, every payment that they were promised in the promissory note? Yes, yeah. sir. I knew the answer, but I wanted <laughs> the audience to hear it. So again, you're listening to the show, go to www.saltandlightpropertysolutions.com. Get a copy of the book, uh, set up an appointment to talk with Banjo or Erica, learn how you can get involved and uh, be a private lender with them and earn a lot of money safely and securely. By the way, Banjo and Erica, before I let you go, um, how did you come up with the name Salt and Light Property Solutions? Oh, that's a good one. That's a good question. So I, I actually uh, tell this to everyone that comes to our private lender luncheon every single time because not everybody recognizes the term salt and light. In fact, a lot of people say salt and pepper, uh, salt, light, all, all kind of different things, but it's actually a biblical term. It comes from Matthew chapter 5, 13 through 16. I can't quote it all the way uh, word for word, but basically God is telling us uh, or Jesus is telling us that nobody's going to grab a, grab a light and put it under a basket or hide it right in the city that's set on a hill. Everybody's going to be able to see it and salt. If it becomes tasteless, it's just kind of useless. People can just trample on it. And we're called as Christians to be the salt and light of the world and let our good deeds be known before God in the world. So honestly, um, when I named our business Salt and Light Property Solutions, I passed it by my pastor first because I just wanted to I didn't want to do anything uh, that wasn't uh, glorifying God by any means. I wanted to wanted to glorify God through it. But honestly, what it helps do is helps keeps uh, it help keeps us um accountable. It holds us accountable with our business dealings too. I love the name of your company. Thanks. And I love that you two are not putting your light underneath the bushel basket and you're letting your light shine every single day. Erica, I'll let you go first on any final comments and then Banjo, I'll let you do your final comments and we will call this show a wrap. I just want to thank you for uh, letting us come on this podcast and letting everybody know about our program and hopefully they learned something today. Yep. And, it. and it's good to see you brother. Always appreciate the invite. It was fun. 
I, I like, like I was saying, uh, like I tell my people at the private lender luncheon, hope these listeners at least got a little bit of nugget, something to help them out in their life. And by all means, uh, if they ever need anything from us, free to reach out. And thank you again, Jay. Thank you all. Thank you for sharing your story. Uh, you two are a model. I mean, you two are a perfect model for other real estate investors, whether you're starting out or you're seasoned and you want to grow your company, make a difference and raise a lot of private money. Manjo and Erica have an amazing day, a better than amazing day on purpose. And thank you for joining me. And thank you all of our viewers and listeners that have joined us on this amazing episode. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. If you are on, um, if you're listening to any of your podcast platforms, be sure to follow me and rate and review. That will certainly help us keep coming back with more amazing guests like Erica and Banjo. If you happen to be watching on YouTube, be sure to subscribe, ring that bell so you don't miss out on the upcoming episodes with more amazing guests. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, wishing you all the best. And I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's J-C-O-N-N-E-R.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.